All right, Gorm, we're at the top of the hour if you're ready to get started. Yes, I am. Welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, we have two experts today. We have Eva Davis, thermal expert from the EPA, calling in from Oklahoma. And we have Emily Crownover from TRS um, assisting with this as well. And the title is really power and energy density. We're trying to introduce a very couple of very useful terms that will make it more easy for all of us to understand, you know, thermal projects, why they, they heat up the way they do, um, and, and to predict the duration of these. So you see a, a typical thermal project, maybe not super typical, but it's one in China. Um, on, on the screen right now, you see um, a well field here with, in this case, electrodes treating the subsurface, the chemicals are coming out at, at near steam temperature and running through all these pipes and are getting treated over on the right in an above grade treatment system. Um, there can be residences nearby who, that worry about how long is this going to take. There can be uh, real estate you know, going on. And in this case, the uh, high rise you see behind here, uh, there will be more high rises like those built on top of this area. This is in Sushu, China. As soon as this thermal remedy was complete, um, they started building building houses. So you can see if this is a, a, a thermal project, there's a lot of um, focus on how much power do we need to bring out to, to get all this done? Um, how big a power supply, for instance? How big should the transformers be? You see some of them sitting over here in the back, um, and there are power control containers shown in this case quite a, quite a lot because the volume was substantial. Um, so, so, so how much power do we need? How fast is it going to go? How long will this site be occupied and unavailable for other use? And and will it be a nuisance to the people living next door to it for six months or a year or two years? Um, that, those are major questions when you're planning thermal projects. And of course, how much energy are we going to be using and what is that going to cost? Um, that is something that needs to be predicted. And overall, these questions are important for both the cost of the remedy and also for the sustainability aspects. Um, and sometimes a client needs to know these things with pretty good accuracy before they actually make a decision. So a couple of, of things here that are super critical is how fast can you heat up the site to the temperature that you need and how much is the total energy demand going to be to heat up the site and to get to the remedial endpoints that, that are set. And to that end, um, the two, the two basically parameters we were talking about are called power density and energy density. And I would like to start by, by asking Emily, essentially, how do we define these? And can you give us a, a quick introduction to those terms, please? Sure, absolutely. So as Gore mentioned, um, we use power and energy parameters whenever we're designing a site. And power, if you can think of that as it's the rate of the energy that's being delivered into the site. So it's how fast you're going. Um, the energy is the, um, you know, how far you've gone. So the amount of energy that you've input into the subsurface. And whenever we're designing a site, we evaluate key parameters like power and energy density. So a power density would be the amount of power that you're applying to the site divided by the target treatment volume. The energy density would be the energy over that target treatment volume. And then we use these parameters. We um, do both um, theoretical and empirical modeling um, for all of our sites. And we look back at these parameters and see um, how our model outputs compare to past projects that we've remediated. Very good. Um, so let me ask Eva, Eva, you have you've overseen or, or reviewed, I would say, probably hundreds of thermal projects, more than any of us as, as the EPA expert that often gets called in you know, to help interpret thermal performance and, and how they're going. Um, if we can start with the energy density term, in other words, in the number of kilowatt hours to be used for every cubic yard of 
of sur subsurface material in the treatment zone. Do you have any rules of thumb for how much one should should include in a good thermal project? And and what what's your kind of what your, what's your take on that? Well, I consider uh, the over uh, the overall energy that they're uh, projecting to use, whether I'm reviewing a um, a proposal or whether I'm reviewing a, a a draft design, I always look at uh, the total amount of power that they expect to use. It gives me a uh, a good comparison as to you know how aggressive uh, it looks like the the remedy is going to be. And I always look at energy density as well. And sometimes that's not given. Um, and when it's not given in the proposal or in the draft design, I always calculate it just uh, as it's shown here is the uh, kilowatt hours uh, uh, divided by the uh, the treatment volume. And I remember from some years ago uh, hearing that uh, it generally takes about 200 kilowatt hours per cubic yard to treat a site adequately. And I don't even remember now where I heard that, but um, that is what I've uh, I recall. Um, and, and what I've seen as I review sites, and I don't know that I've reviewed hundreds, but I have reviewed quite a few. Um, the for it seems like when the contaminants are volatile, um, a lot of times the energy density they're projecting is is less than 200 kilowatt hours per cubic yard. Uh, when it's semi-volatile contaminants, then uh, um, it's uh, usually a higher energy density is uh, proposed. Um, but uh, those generalizations don't always hold true. So I know that there has to be more that goes into it. Um, I would guess uh, things like the hydrogeology, how much water there is, um, or the uh, amount of mass, uh, you know, contaminants to be recovered, you know, and the, and the treatment goals. Um, is, uh, is that right, Emily, that, you know, um, are those the factors that come into to play as to how much, uh, uh, what energy density is actually needed? That's correct. And, you know, whenever we're modeling for a site, um, we, a lot of parameters go into the model. Uh, we have more than 70 that are entered in and we do a, an analysis on every project. So for instance, the treatment zone geometry, the size of the volume, well, we do a, a, we look at the surface area to volume ratio, the amount of heat losses that we might see um, the lithology, whether it's a clay or a sand or a bedrock, uh, those all will impact our model outputs. Um, Eva, you mentioned hydrogeology. So if there's a high groundwater flow that may have a cooling effect on the treatment volume, um, that's, that's a big part of what goes into the model. Um, the total area is another key parameter. That is something, um, an aspect where if there are very high levels, um, it can actually slow the remediation. And that would be an instance where we would apply a higher energy density for that site um, and, and further the contaminant extent. So that's, a, that's another big part of the analysis. Um, you know, and they, whenever we're looking at um, you know, the site remedial goals, it's, it's very specific to the contaminants when we are looking at the amount of power and energy that are required. So for instance, the contaminants of concern, um, on, on the next slide, we have um, a graph that shows, you know, the, this is an example of two different contaminants of concerns with very different characteristics. Um, for instance, in the orange line, um, that is a, a contaminant that has a boiling point of 114 degrees Celsius and a very low Henry's law constant. So that is, um, that means that the contaminant will um, not readily transfer from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. Um, the curve in blue is showing uh, a contaminant that has a much lower uh, boiling point at 74 degrees Celsius and a higher Henry's law constant. And what this graph is showing is this is an example of some model outputs whenever we're analyzing the site. This is specific to a recent model that we just ran. Um, but if you look on the, on the y-axis, that's the percent remaining of the contaminant of concern. The x-axis is the design energy density. And what you'll see is if you're trying to achieve a, a less than 90% reduction, the design energy densities for these two contaminants are actually very similar. But as you start needing to achieve higher percent reductions, 
the amount of energy per cubic yard that needs to be input is significantly higher for the orange curve. So it's so critical whenever we're analyzing a site, we need to not only take into account the percent reduction that's needed to be achieved, but also the contaminants of concern and the, um, the characteristics of those contaminants. And that can be something when we're looking at sites, um, we have many sites that we've remediated. We do a look back of, of the energy input that, that has occurred, the um, remedial goals and the percent reductions that were achieved. And, um, but there are cases where if it's a new contaminant, um, it may actually be advantageous to do further laboratory testing. And Eva, as a question for you, when is it a good time to, and what is your experience with um, treatability studies? Well, if we uh, go on to the next slide, the first of mine, uh, I have done steam injection treat treatability studies in the lab. It's uh, a, the schematic shows the setup that I've got there. It's uh, pumps that uh, supply a, a, a steady stream of water into the steam generator, and that steam then goes into the top of a really relatively small column, about six inches uh, long and uh, two inches in diameter. Uh, and the effluent coming out of the bottom of the column goes through a heat exchanger to uh, condense it back to a liquid uh, and with a, that is then collected for analysis. Uh, thermocouples just above and below the column is, and uh, two within the column then uh, record the temperature uh, fairly continuously. So it's pretty easy setup. Um, uh, but I've certainly learned some things from having done these uh, experiments. Uh, so I'm glad I've had the chance to do them. Um, the, initially, the first sites that uh, I did the treatability studies for were creosote sites. And I noticed that uh, with some of the experiments that I did, I got very good results with you know, 95 and greater uh, percent recoveries of the creosote. And in other experiments, I had much less recoveries. In fact, one experiment had practically no, uh, essentially no creosote recovery. And so I had to go back and take a real good close look at my data as to what was going on and why there were these differences. And what I noticed is, is we, if we go on to the next slide now, is that the uh, there were diff the differences in recovery seemed to be related to the amount of effluent that I collected uh, versus the amount of steam that had been uh, injected. And this graph of uh, cumulative volume of uh, effluent collected versus the amount of uh, steam injected and that steam on a uh, condensed uh, water basis. Um, the, the dashed red line through there shows uh, that uh, an equal amount of uh, steam injected and effluent collected. And that's what you would expect then when you've got just water going through the column, uh, water going in and water being uh, collected at the, uh, in, in the effluent line. And you can see that two of the experiments uh, the, the curve of uh, effluent collected versus steam injected, it, you know, there's much more effluent collected than what the steam had been injected. Uh, and, and that, I realized, was because the steam was actually entering the column in those experiments and, and pushing out the water that was initially in the pore space, pushing that out in front of the, the steam front. Um, and with those columns, that was where we got the very good recoveries, 99% uh, uh, and better on, on some of them. Uh, and uh, then the, the line, uh, the black line that is just above that red dashed line, that one had very poor recovery, uh, essentially no recovery of the creosote. And I realized it was because the uh, a steam front had never been, uh, uh, been injected into the column, the, there was enough back pressure on that steam that it remained as hot water. Uh, and and then, then the other curve, uh, which initially is below the, the red line, uh, that column was not uh, fully saturated to begin with. And so the 
some of the injected steam remained in the column. And then you can see for a section of that uh, curve, the, uh, the slope is much higher. And that indicates that there was a steam front in there for a, at least a short amount of time before it then reverted back to a hot water injection that you can tell because the slope of that line then drops off again and becomes closer to the, uh, to the slope of the red line. And, and for that column, the, um, uh, the recovery was sort of intermediate. Um, it, it was fairly good showing me that uh, even a small amount of uh, steam within the column did a much uh, better job of recovering the contaminants uh, than just a hot water flood. And this was very instructive to me and very interesting to me because I had started off with uh, looking at hot water injection uh, for these types of uh, relatively viscous contaminants such as creosote or uh, some, some of the crude oil oils. And uh, so I learned from this pretty quickly that uh, the to actually uh, generate a steam front and have that uh, steam distillation going on and the volatilization of the contaminants is very important for their recovery. And if we go on to the next slide, uh, I also you know, took a further look at the uh, data I collected and, and realized that uh, the vast majority of the contaminants were coming out pretty early on. And now this data that I'm showing here is again for the creosote. And, and in this case, the creosote had a very high naphthalene content, as you can tell from the graph here. Um, but I, it, um, you can see that the vast majority of the mass came out like in the first two pore volumes uh, or so of the steam injected. And then, and the, that is a logarithmic uh, curve on the uh, logarithmic scale on the Y axis. And so that, that concentration in the effluent is, is dropping off pretty drastically uh, after the first couple of pore volumes. Um, and and, and that's for a relative for uh, semi-volatile contaminants. Uh, I want to go and show you also the type of uh, what the recovery looks like for a volatile contaminant. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, first you see here the uh, the progress of the steam front as being as uh, shown by the temperature front, and you see that that we started taking that second sample. Uh, just about the time that uh, the middle of the, the steam front reached the middle of the column. And, and then uh, if we go on to the next slide, it shows you that uh, um, it, it was in that second, column, uh, second sample, uh, just when this, uh, this sample was reaching steam temperatures is when uh, essentially all of the chlorobenzene that was in this column was uh, recovered. Uh, during the heat up phases, the effluent sample number one, not much. During the second sample uh, was, is essentially all of it. And overall, that was a greater than 99% uh, chlorobenzene uh, recovery uh, in those experiments. But, and, and while these experiments were very instructive to me in some ways, um, and, and they can be very good to uh, help convince the skeptical uh, site owner that, uh, that a thermal remediation can really work on their site with their uh, specific mix of contaminants, you can't just apply these results directly to the field. I was working with a, a one-dimensional column. The steam was uh, flowing in one direction, uh, whereas when you inject steam in the subsurface, it's a radial flow from your injection well. Um, and, and therefore, the, how much steam the soil uh, sees depends upon how far it is from that injection well. And so, this can't be just directly extrapolated to the field. But, you know, Emily, do you do uh, treatability studies as well? And can you then get information on the energy needed that you can apply to the field? 
Yeah, on, on the next slide, we have um, pictures of some examples of our laboratory treatability testing setup. So just, just as you were describing, you know, we are trying to mimic uh, an, a thermal remediation at the laboratory scale. Um, this is just showing, showing pictures of the controlled heating environment. We want to raise the temperature of soil um, to a, you know, a controlled temperature for a, a certain duration, and we look at percent recoveries. And if we go to the next slide, this is just a summary of the different types of treatability testing that we can do. Um, the first column is showing just a, a quick description of some of the different tests we can look at. Um, you know, if we're looking at volatilization of contaminants um, within, you know, the when we're look, targeting the boiling point of at temperatures above or at or below the boiling point of water, um, that would be more for ERH and TCH, um, and that would be an evaluation for VOCs and co-contaminants. Um, if we are targeting um, contaminants like dioxins, um, those would be targeting temperatures above the boiling point of water, so that would be just TCH. Um, and then, you know, if we're looking to evaluate the degradation of contaminants, not volatilization, we can um, raise the temperature to lower temperature ranges at which we would expect um, elevated degradation reactions to occur. And all of that, um, it, when we're at, whenever we're doing an analysis of our treatability testing results, um, a graph on the bottom is an example of an output of what some of um, the uh, treatability testing results would look like. So on the y-axis, we're looking at the percent remaining of the contaminant of of concern. And then on the x-axis, we're looking at the energy density. And so um, if it's a, a contaminant that we may not be familiar with, or there would be a reason to, um, a, a request to perform the treatability testing, that's really when we would um, recommend. And, and Gorm would love more information on that if, um, in terms of your experience of when um, it's been requested more often for treatability testing. Yeah. Um... Before I answer that, um, I realized, as usual, I forgot to let everybody know that we have a QA and a um, opportunity. At the top of your screen, there should be a drop-down menu that says Q&A. And please, if you have any, any comments or questions, type them in. And then in about 10, 15 minutes, when we, we come to the end of this discussion, we can address those questions. Um, so Emily asked, essentially, when do you do a lab treatability test, you know, and, and, and when do you need one to design um, a thermal remedy? Um, the, the first, the easy way of asking it is we very rarely do them these days because we've done so many thermal projects, you know, probably more than 300 in the world now, maybe 400 even. GRS has done almost half of those. And we normally know just by getting the information from a site when the chemicals of concern, the remediation goals, the soil type, the depth, whether the water table is at a certain level. We normally have several sites that were already treated so we know what to do and we can, we can model it. However, there's a couple of times a client um, just needs to see it proven at his or her site. Um, then of course we, we may be, be be doing a, either a laboratory test and sometimes even a pilot test to demonstrate, yes, it is going to work at your site as well as, as for these contaminants. But other than that, it's typically when the chemicals of concern fall kind of in between the volatiles and the semi-volatiles and are it have a boiling point somewhere in the 200 degrees um, to 250 degree range is typical those where we're not always quite sure. And as you see here in that blue band on the graph, that those contaminants can be <clears throat> naphthalenes, methylated naphthalenes, trichlorobenzenes, um, aniline, and some, some polar compounds as well that, that are very soluble in water. Sometimes we do laboratory tests for those. And, and oftentimes those laboratory tests are used to number one, figure out if we do need to go to thermal conduction heating because we have to be hotter than the boiling point because then we can't do it with steam or with, with ERH. We need to then go to TCH, so that's a major decision. And secondly, how much do we need to heat this thing? Um, like if it was a turkey, how long would it have to stay in the oven before it was done in the middle, right? It's the same thing. Um, that translates to energy, both target temperature and to an energy density that we then need to put into our design. So I would say we probably do these on maybe 10% of, 
or less of the new sites we're looking at and, and sites with unusual um, contamination. Uh, or if there's a lot of organic carbon peat layers, sometimes we need to do it too because the sorption in those layers is, is very strong. Um, let me ask you um, back, Emily, so with all this, all these complexities, you know, we have hundreds of different chemicals. We have site conditions and sites can be small or large and have water or no water. How, how are you able to relatively easily you know, whip out several estimates per week for thermal remediation? Isn't it so complex that it's almost impossible to, to estimate how much energy we need and how long it's going to take? Yeah, so I, in terms of the process that we go through whenever we're modeling a site, um, you know, we were showing as a previous, um, as an example of a treatability study output, what a an steaming energy density would look like for different percent reductions. But when you were describing, we, we know this for many contaminants. We've treated many sites um, you know, where we've seen consistent steaming energy density values for different contaminants and percent reductions. So we have a database where we're looking at those steaming energy densities and we use that as a starting point. So if we were to strip away all of the losses and it was just an apples to apples comparison of that specific contaminant steaming energy density, the percent reduction that's needed, um, and then also looking um, at, you know, of all the contaminants of concern, making sure you're selecting the right one that's the hardest to remediate. So we're, that is the driving contaminant for the thermal model. And then once we establish that, we can then add on all of the layers of the site characteristics. So we can add on to like you were describing, so that they, if we have a lot of heat losses, surface area to volume ratios, if we have um, significant groundwater flow that could be cooling the site, um, if we are expecting um, different levels of um, groundwater extraction, that all goes into the model. So we can make sure whenever we're losing that heat, we want to make sure we add enough energy in so we can overcome those losses and make sure we're getting the, the base steaming energy density that's needed to achieve the remedial goals. We had talked a little bit earlier about the fraction of organic carbon and how that can impact remediation rates. So that can slow a remedi remediation if it's an LNAP site. Um, uh, all of those parameters go in and again that can increase the steaming energy density. And then you know when we are have a feel for all of our remedial objectives, we've input all the site parameters on the right hand side, that's an example of um, out, an output from our model. So on the Y axis, it shows the power. And then on the X axis, it shows the duration of the remediation. And we run this for every site to make sure that we are inputting enough energy to overcome those heat losses and achieve the target temperatures. So on the blue, um, the blue line that's showing the, the power input, the energy input for the site, um, this is an example of a TCH site. Um, and then you're seeing uh, in the orange line, that's the total uh, losses um, that, that we're expecting for the site. And then the steam and water removal are the gray and the yellow lines. And then the red line is the resultant temperature increase. So if we were not inputting enough energy to overcome all of these losses, that temperature curve would not achieve the boiling point of water or achieve in this case at 100 degrees Celsius. And if it, um, if we, that would be an indication to us, let's say it, it just made it to 80 degrees Celsius, we would need to be able to, we would need to change the design and make sure that we had enough, a tight enough electrode or heater spacing to be able to get sufficient energy into the ground and achieve those target temperatures. Wow, thank you. So, so when I look at the graph like that, I look at the orange line and the area underneath it, that should be kind of a, a measure of how much energy actually over time was, is used, right, um, or, or, or lost. That's, that looks to be about half of the energy that, that was injected. That, that's, that's quite a bit. So, so that means if you, if you have a site and you just measure the volume and you, you calculate the heat capacity and you say, okay, it's this much, this many kilojoules per kilogram, and I have this many kilograms, you multiply that up, you would, you would underestimate the energy demand by at least a factor of two if you, if you just did that by thermodynamics, right? 
Absolutely. And that's something that when we're doing the analysis, that that heat loss analysis is so critical because it can be such a substantial percentage of the overall energy input. And you'll find that you may never get to the target temperature if you don't have enough subsurface infrastructure or electrodes or heaters in place to be able to achieve the target temperature. Okay. So, uh, so we, we can learn from this that it's really important to, to get the power in as fast as possible, right? So that we can get these, these, this blue curve in this case, uh, the power in, because we know it's got to go in. Can you tell us a little bit about how you, how we optimize the power delivery to the subsurface? And if, if you don't mind, um, use, use electrical resistance heating as, as an example, please. And the, so on the next slide, we have a, a graph on the right that shows an example. This is a recent site that we remediated. This is showing an example of how we optimize sites. We use different approaches and methods, depending on the technology, for electrical resistance heating, where it's um, essential that the electrodes remain, um, have a certain level of moisture for to conduct ele electrical current. Um, we, do, uh, we do pay close attention to are the amount of water that we're adding to our electrodes to ensure that we are optimizing the, the amount of power that's delivered. So when we start seeing um, a, an electrode that is not receiving sufficient water, we start seeing a decline in power that's shown in that red line in the graph on the right. And we'll, we can see um, sometimes a rapid decline depending on the site and its characteristics. Um, those blue dots are showing when we would be, we have an automated drip delivery system. So that's showing when the water's added and you can see um, a, a very a quick response and significant response to the overall power um, at that electrode. And we do this analysis on um, using uh, at each electrode. And we, when we're looking at, um, you know, how we want to add water, we're trying to, we want to add enough so we're seeing a response, but we don't want to add too much so that it's not necessarily helping the remediation. So we're, um, that's where we're really looking to, to maximize the power density to keep pushing until we, we no longer see a response. And we really work to optimize the, um, the water delivery for, for every site. So this is an example of an electrical resistance heating optimization approach, but we do this for all of our sites um, regardless of the technology, we're, we're learning and, and continuing to develop our technology. So we're um, being as efficient as possible with the energy that we're delivering. Thank you very much for that. And I just want to remind everyone you, you can, you can um, type in questions. Um, we are, have come to, to the Q&A part of, of this. So there's still lots of room to ask questions. Um, and feel free to type them in. I, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, you know, this is a really good chance to ask Eva Davis some, some tough questions. Normally it's always her asking us tough questions, right? So hopefully there's somebody out there who wants to do that. And um, I can ask you, Emily, you just talked about, about this, this uh, voltage or power optimization to a site. Can you tell us a little bit about how much power can you actually get in, let's say per foot of heater or per foot of electrode? If you, if you look vertically at a site, how much can you actually get in there in terms of watts per foot? Yeah, so it, it is dependent on the site characteristics, but this plot here shows an example of three uh, recent ERH sites um, they were, where we were looking at um, the power linear power density. So that's the power per linear foot. Um, previously, we were talking about the, the energy, the power density as a function of the treatment volume. But when you look at um, when trying to compare technologies and when it might be appropriate to select a specific technology over another, um, this is showing for, for ERH, for instance, at these sites. These were um, sandstone, si sandstone sites. And you can see we were achieving anywhere between 400 and over 800 watts per foot. Whereas typically for our TCH remediations, our maximum power delivery watts per foot is, 
is actually much lower than that. So we, we well exceeded the watts per foot they were able to deliver. And as a result, we see that in the, the heat up rates. So you can see on the next slide, um, so the site that was in yellow um, on that previous graph, this is showing the, the temperature data from that site. And you can see in, in just a matter of weeks, we were able to get up to boiling temperatures. And part of that is just a function of the amount of just um, net power watts per foot we're able to input into the subsurface compared to a TCH remediation for that particular project. But every site is different, right? So we are, um, there are times when specific technologies are, are more appropriate or recommended over another, and that's where the modeling and taking into account all of the site characteristics is so critical. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you. Eva, at any time, feel free to, um, to uh, say something here as well right um also we have I, yeah yeah i was just going to say that uh i'm very in, uh, impressed with uh this optimization of your power delivery and seeing how water affects it uh i hadn't realized uh just uh what it took to although i've always known you have water delivery i'm surprised at the uh, the real effect that it has and uh, and, and what you're able to do now with getting energy into the ground. That's great. Thank you. And and by no means did we mean to uh, talk bad about thermal conduction heating right on that graph. We show the line saying you can get in about 300 watts per foot with GCH and with ERH, you can sometimes do double or triple that. Uh, we're by no means um, using that as a way of, of talking down TCH as an, as an example what you see on the screen right now is a, is one of our own operating thermal conduction heating sites. Um, so we're very happy with both technologies and steam, of course. Um, so um, this site in particular has 152 heaters operating as we speak and is going very, very well. I, I don't see any other questions um, that have come in. On my screen, have you be, you been able to see any? Uh, I I see one now. I actually saw one. So, the prior slide indicated a cap of power input for TCH at roughly 350 watts per foot. Can you speak to this limitation as a function of heating technology formation, subsurface surface conditions, or other site-specific issues? <clears throat> I, I can start if you if you will. Um, so I have been part of probably operating 60, 70 thermal conduction heating um, projects. <clears throat> and <clears throat> at some sites we can, in the beginning, when the site is nice and wet, and if we have a good large diameter casing, um, four inches or so or, or bigger, we can get up around 350 watts to 400 watts per foot. What happens if you try to do more than that is that your your steel casing gets too hot. There isn't enough time for the formation to conduct away the heat and your temperature gradient gets really steep. And, and if you don't watch it carefully with, a, a, with temperature sensors, for instance, you can overheat the heater element and it starts to melt and then you have a short to the casing and, and you, have to, you have to stop doing it. Um, so for thermal conduction heating, we are just <clears throat> limited to how fast the formation on the outside of the casing can conduct the, the heat away. Um, with electrical resistance heating, it's different because it, the borehole itself doesn't get much hotter than the boiling point of water. And as long as it is wet and there's an electrical connection, you can have a lot more basically electricity delivered to the formation. So you don't have that, that overheating um, problem. I would direct the next one to you, Emily. That one is called, is it difficult to achieve density in the Vedo zone? I'm, I'm assuming that's power density. In other words, um, is it difficult to heat up in above the water table? <laughs> assuming yeah. that because it, there isn't as much water up there. Definitely. So that, that is part of the analysis that's done when we're selecting a technology. If it is in the Veda zone, we want to make sure we have, if it, for instance, if it's an ERA site, we want to make sure there's sufficient moisture present. So we um, typically in a Veda sun site, we would, we would absolutely install a rewetting system. So we would be able to um, rewet the, the electrodes as needed to help ensure performance. 
Um, there is also in the beta zone, there is a psychrometric effect as well that helps to further enhance remediation of contaminants. And actually, Eva, if you don't mind me asking you that question, you know, your experience of using thermal in the beta zone, um, you know, we do, we do see, right, in terms of the, and I'm not sure if you'd want to talk about this, but in terms of the azeotropic boiling point in the beta zone and, and what the targets are typically in the beta zone versus the saturated zone. Well, always for the saturated zone, the boiling point of water, I would, uh, wouldn't normally uh, recommend anything less than that. Uh, even when you get a cold boiling effect and uh, can recover the napple at uh, lower temperatures, there's still that uh, desire most of the time, uh, almost all the time, to uh, uh, reduce the dissolved phase concentrations as well. And I always like, uh, you, you mentioned the, uh, psychrometric effect in the Vedo zone. Uh, yeah, you um, in the Vedo zone, uh, maybe it doesn't have to be 100 uh, centigrade uh, to uh, keep the contaminants uh, in uh, vaporized so they can be recovered. But I like to see that uh, those temperatures up there high, uh, as high as they can be, uh, so that there isn't uh, a chance of uh, condensation in in the Vedo zone. Uh, you know, once the uh, contaminants are uh, out of the the water, you, you want to keep them moving towards your into your extraction system, which means keeping them in the vapor phase. Um, but normally, uh, you know, when we're looking at uh, writing a request for proposals, I would like to specify in the uh, uh, a, a minimum temperature of around 80 centigrade that would apply to uh, the the Vado zone, and I'll always try to push it for as much heat up there as we can get. No, that's that's really helpful, and that's part of what goes into our designs. Is we want, as Eva was mentioning, we want to make sure we're extracting any contaminants that we volatilize. Um, so, and, and we're extracting them. So we make sure we have sufficient vapor recovery. Um, typically, in our electrodes, we'll co-locate uh, vapor recovery screens, and then the TCH projects, um, depending on the design, we will um, co-locate. And sometimes it's a little bit of less of a density, but it, it very much we want to make sure we have sufficient extraction to and um, sufficient heat up as it as you get closer to the surface so we do get good extraction of the contaminants. That's almost a, a perfect segue to the next question Grant has asked. Um, what impact will an insulating cover have on, on these calculations of, of heat up, right? Um, do they have a material impact on how much which power density you need when you're heating shallower soils? So yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to, I can chime in on that one or if you'd like to, Gorn. No, please do, yeah. Yeah, so that that's um, actually, that's a great question. And that, that's a big part of what goes into the modeling as well as the heat losses at the surface. So depending on the material um, and if, if there's any kind of um, existing insulating surface cover, um, we do an analysis looking at um, the insulative properties of what is on the surface because we can get significant heat losses if we are heating close to the surface um, and that can significantly impact our ability to heat up. So it's absolutely a part of the analysis and it's something that it can many times be more cost effective to, you know, while the upfront cost for an insulative cover, there is, it is an investment, but it can um, really help you in your remediation to make sure you're maintaining sufficient temperatures throughout the treatment interval. Do, do you have a, a generalization as to um, what kind of a de you know treatment depth you need you know below the, the ground surface where you would need a cover and, and where you probably don't need one? Did, did I ask that? Do you understand my question? Yeah, no, I, and, and Gorn, please chime in on this too. I, I think it's very site dependent. So if you have a site that's completely indoors where you won't get exposure to rainwater and um, rain permeation, that can definitely impact it. But it's very, you know, we're, we'll model it based on every site characteristics. And I don't know, Gorm, if you wanted to share some general rules of thumb. Yeah, it, it really matters uh, how, how permeable this shallow material is. If it has a high vertical permeability, in other words, if, if, if steam and air can readily move up, we're more worried about it uh, doing that and condensing at, at the surface. So that's almost like a, a, a more difficult scenario is a very permeable topsoil <clears throat> with mass down below 
and then the steam tends to rise up and, and want to condense before we can get it extracted. If it's a very tight top 5, 10 feet and we're just treating below that, we're more likely to be able to, to treat underneath it without having to treat all the way to the surface and have an insulated cover there. So again, it, it, it's site specific and we do an analysis of where the, is the mass to begin with and then when we cook it and it starts to create steam bubbles and start to push where is it going to flow and we then make sure we don't give it a chance to condense before it, it reaches extraction points so site specific um, as, as many of these things are for sure but if you can avoid putting a vapor cover on it often costs four to eight dollars per square foot so for a big site for, for an acre it could easily be a hundred thousand or two hundred thousand for a vapor cover if you can avoid doing that by having a better vapor extraction strategy or if you have a tighter surface layer that saves a lot of, of energy and time and cost if you can do that um, well, thank you. I'll keep that in mind when I'm reviewing uh, designs and proposals. Yeah. yeah, good. I have one final question from Tim Pack. Um, thank you, Tim. And, and the question is essentially uh, one of removal mechanisms. You know, do we look at whether a chemical comes out in one way or the other? Is it a physical removal? Is it an abiotic degradation? Is it biologically degrading? So I'm, I'm guessing that the question is quite general for thermal remediation. Um, how, do you, how do we know which mechanisms are going to be the ones getting the chemicals out of the ground and, and how do we take that into account? Yeah, I, I can. Um, so whenever we're looking at the contaminants of concern, we can look, there are some that are more susceptible to biodegradation or biotic reactions. So we have, um, whenever we're looking at sites where we might expect to see um, some reductions, many times we'll actually see further reductions after we remediate a site and it cools down, we'll see enhanced degradation. And we can do tests to see if it's um, an, an environment that would be, would facilitate or promote those biotic reactions. Um, we have uh, heated sites where below the boiling point of water looking to enhance both biotic and abiotic reactions. And you can look at those site characteristics to see if it would be an optimal environment for those um, biotic reactions. Um, abiotic reactions, we see that at a number of our sites, um, hydrolysis sites, for instance, 111 TCA is an example, but um, there are many contaminants that will, will hydrolyze um, and, at, and that reaction will be enhanced at elevated temperatures. Um, so there is, um, it, it's very site dependent, but it can, and, and contaminant dependent, but there, we do, we do see these reductions and um, particularly see it after, um, after thermal remediation, where we see continued declines of concentrations over time. Fantastic. <clears throat> most of the, most of the previous um, slides we, we presented here were for chemicals that didn't degrade, right? So we mostly, that was mostly for physical removal through vaporization, Tim, um, and Eva's, Eva's lab stuff, stuff. In addition to that, also the steam distillation and, and displacement by a steam front. So that was mostly all physical. Yeah, and we, but we definitely have some sites, even for energetic, energetic compounds that degrade at 70 degrees, 80 degrees Celsius by hydrolysis or pyrolysis. And so instead of 200 kilowatt hours per cubic yard, energy density needed we sometimes need just half of that and we still get remedial good remedial results so that was a, that's an excellent question and a good way to to round this off i think um we were very much focused on the physical removal but there are other other ways um, um that also are important and um i would just want to thank everybody for dialing in and show the next webinar in this series that comes up on December 16. Um, it is essentially about PFAS challenges again, and, and in particularly those that major oil companies and chemical companies are facing now that these forever chemicals have been discovered and it becomes more and more evident that they're not just where you're fighting fires. They, they are more, more often found, uh, even if you're trying to close a refinery, sometimes there, there is PFAS there. So, 
that will be the focus in December. And we will have experts from ExxonMobil and Honeywell presenting along with me and Brett Trowbridge, the, the CEO of TRS. And we really hope you'll be back for that. Thank you very much. Thank you.